So before doing a deeper dive into the primary content of this webinar, I want to share a little bit with you um, about Optima EHS approach and um, and also our our philosophy. And our, our approach is a four-phase approach that aligns really well with Lean Six Sigma Dimaic methodology of define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, right? And we just sort of distilled it down into something that is a, a little more simple. So the discovery phase is really identifying what we don't know that we don't know, right? You have to gather data. And so that comes in a, a few different forms, primarily ergonomic evaluation using very scientific methods such as Reba Rula NIOSH. Uh, we even have some video motion capture sort of things that really add a visual component to the discovery phase, as well as engaging employees either formally or informally in um, say comfort surveys or just talking with employees actually. And so once, once we've done that identification of where our issues may be lying, we move into the development stage, which is really taking that data and defining uh, elements that would improve the, the, the ergonomic veracity of that particular situation and coming up with a plan and prioritizing that plan and then moving into the system up phase, which is implementing those recommendations. And, and also it could co contain components of educating employees on the use of a tool or a new process or a stretching program, or maybe one of the components of the development stage was um, a rotational schedule and um, and making sure that employees are ready to receive the benefit of the development process that we've done. And then we move on to system check. And this is vital. I've been doing this for a long time and going back and making sure you did everything right is so critical. So in system check, we want to make sure that we haven't introduced any unintended consequences and additionally, we can then quantify and, and demonstrate objectively that we have achieved our goals. And once we've done this, we've basically written our success story. And so now we can push that out to the employee population and we can push that up to leadership so, so people can see that, yes, this made a difference and leaders will be more likely in the future to, 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 to maybe, maybe we'll get to a yes quicker. Maybe they'll say, yeah, this worked last time. They proved their results. Let's, let's keep on this path. So um, system check is a vital part of that process. Now, the, 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 the philosophy that we subscribe to is that optimal ergonomics is rooted in best practices, becomes reality with teamwork, and is sustained through uncompromising commitment. So if you have these two elements, you have the approach, you have the philosophy, you've primed yourself or positioned yourself to be in a place of potential ergonomic excellence. There is a definite hierarchy in the development of a musculoskeletal disorder. And musculoskeletal disorders, as you probably know, are the itises, you know, the, the, the tendonitises and the epicondylitises, and they are the, um, the injuries that, that affect the musculoskeletal system. So it typically starts at the base of the pyramid, but I'm going to start with the top of the pyramid because there are times when someone develops a musculoskeletal injury and it's an event. You think, well, that's when it happened. There was a pop, there was a sharp pain. There was some event you were doing where your tissues actually failed. Um, and this can happen, but in reality, for the most part, where musculoskeletal injuries happen are 
or where they begin are at the base of the pyramid, right? So fatigued or stressed tissue. And this can happen from something that's highly repetitive where the process doesn't offer work rest recoveries, extended shifts, high forces, but that tissue becomes stressed. And what we know through an abundance of research is that stressed and fatigued tissue is far more likely to um, to get injured, right? It just doesn't doesn't have the resources within those structures to um, to continue on with healthy actions without injury necessarily. The the problem here with the fatigued and stressed tissue is that an employee might not know it. There might not be any associated discomfort. But that is the next step. If tissue stays stressed long enough, you will most likely develop uh, discomfort. And discomfort tends to be transient. It comes and goes. You might experience it. Uh, my back gets really tight after lunch, but then it goes away when I go home. Um, the issue here is that you never know when an employee is going to report a discomfort. Are they going to report it immediately? Are they going to go, I don't know what's going on here. And then a few months later, you might hear about it. So, but this is vital because where you have discomfort, you also have the opportunity to make an easy fix. You know, an early fix is an easy fix. So this is this is your catch zone. It's where you want to identify what's going on and implement some solutions and then maybe put in your back pocket, hey, we got to look at this process a little more closely later on. Now, when discomfort is there for a while and tissue continues to be stressed, it most likely progresses to pain. And, and pain tends not to be as transient. It's a little bit more steady state. And this is where it starts to affect your employee's life outside of work, whether it's their sleep, their recreation, um, their ability to participate in recreational activities. So we never want pain, right? We all want our employees to leave work at the end of the day safely and comfortably. And um, But pain kind of stays with us. And when it stays long enough, it starts to affect function. So it starts to affect things like your, your strength, your ability to lift or carry, push, pull, um, the amount of torque force you're able to generate, uh, your range of motion, how high you can lift, how low you can bend, all of those kinds of things. And that's a real point of concern and where um, many employers and employees say, I, we need some medical advice here. And that's that's where it bumps up to the top of the pyramid and you may have a recordable injury. Now, unfortunately, leaders may not hear about any of the lower parts of the pyramid until it becomes a recordable injury. And, and then that usually, you know, that, that sends up, you know, red flares and, and, uh, and well, we have these recordable injuries. What are we going to do about this? And, 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 and that, that, that should be a call to action and, and that should be addressed. But, but the reality is we need to realize that the solution is at the bottom of the pyramid, right? And so I think it's important to foster this understanding throughout the organization. There was, I don't, maybe I'm old, but there, there was a, there used to be this old saying related to savings and finance or whatever, that if you take care of the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. So if you take care of the, the things lower on the pyramid, the discomfort, the fatigue, the stress, that will impact your recordable injury rate. So it, it's just a general concept that, that helps put everything in perspective. So, I think it's important to understand the, di the, the demographics of your employee population, especially as it relates to design 
criteria. So what, what we don't want to do is design for the average. If you think of, you know, a bell shaped curve, the average is just that middle slice. And we're only capturing a, a, a very small percentage of our employee population. So what we usually want to do is design for the range of our employees. And there are some golden design rules that most ergonomists strive to achieve. Um, so these design goals, and they could be viewed as stretch goals because they're very ambitious, is that for vertical heights and horizontal reaches, we want to design for the range that can accommodate a 10th percentile industrial female to a 90th percentile industrial male according to population anthropometric measurements and which is basically the science of body dimension right and that's that's a that's a stretch it's not always achievable but here's an example of where it can be achievable let's say you have office chairs and you have your standard office chair and it's going to fit you know a good range of your population but you're still going to have on the lower side um, probably females who are, that chair is too big for them. And on the other side, uh, larger, taller employees where that chair doesn't meet their needs. So what I've done is found a chair that has acceptable adjustability that offers a petite, regular, and large chair. And in doing that, and they all they all look the same. They're, they're just different dimensions. And so in doing so, I can um, provide a chair recommendation that can accommodate the 10th percentile female up to the 90th percentile male. So that's 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 one example. Um, another design goal is related to strength. So that's lifting, carrying, pushing, pulling, gripping, pinching, torque force. And the design goal there is to accommodate the 25th percentile industrial female. So, so I'm going to admit I cheat here because I'm a 10th percentile industrial female in terms of stature, and I'm a 25th percentile industrial female in terms of strength. So if I am doing an ergonomic evaluation and I can't lift it safely, I can't reach it safely, I'm I'm like a like a test dummy for for what the lower end of that of, of those criteria are. So so yay me on that. There are some exceptions. And the first is clearances and access points, which you want to design for the greatest um, anticipated, you know, the tallest employee possible because everyone else from there will be able to have appropriate um, access and clearance. And then there, there are industries that are very heavy and by necessity, there are greater force requirements. And in, in, in those cases, it's not likely that, um, that, that you could meet the, the ideal design criteria. So that those would be heavy jobs such as firefighters, oil rig workers. And so in the case of that, you can, you can narrow down that design criteria, but you might wanna look at your individual employee population and, and try to figure out um, who those people are that would be at the, the lower limits and then really design for that person. So basically it's customizing your design criteria based on your employee population. And you can do that informally. You can also do that formally. Next slide, please. So there's a paradox in ergonomics and, um, and it, it's, it's basically this, it's basically like, it's, it's likely that it's a very common way you injure your employees and yet it gets deprioritized and there are legitimate reasons for that. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. So in, um, in, 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 if you look at injury data, musculoskeletal ergonomically related injuries may be in your top three or four most commonly occurring. 
And um, it's usually along with cuts, punctures, scrape or lacerations and slip trips and falls. And yet it, it sometimes doesn't get, you know, sort of bumped up to the front of the class in terms of what's going to happen first. And there, there are some reasons for that. So first of all, many MSDs are a little bit ambiguous. Like, where did this start? I don't remember like any particular event. And the employer might be going, I, is this, do we even own this? There's that ambiguity that that can um, negate a little bit of urgency. And also there's, if you look at EHS, they are, overall EHS, they're responsible for keeping us safe from really bad things it, like electrical guarding issues, crane safety, all of that. And so they're dealing with issues that could seriously injure an employee by lunchtime. And so those, that's, they have to be dealt with immediately. And so there's a there's a time concern, especially if EHS is a little bit understaffed. I I I can't say that I've walked into a an organization and said, wow, your EHS is really overstaffed. You must have time to do lots of things, right? So you have to you have to put first things first. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes that's ergonomics. Um ergonomics is by and large unregulated. We, of course, have the, um, the OSHA general duty clause uh, and some other regulating bodies have some minimal amount of language about, um, about ergonomics. But, um, and, and many industries are regulated up to here, right? And so, um, they they don't often want to volunteer and go, hey, let's make more regulations for ourselves, right? So so ergonomics tends to have a more casual feel versus a um a, a formal program type of a thing, with the exception of a few states. For the example, Washington State, uh, Oregon. Uh, California, Michigan, and coming January 1st, Minnesota, my home state. And so there are new OSHA regulations coming out for only specific industries, for distribution centers, meat packaging, and healthcare employers with employees over a headcount of 100. So hopefully you you have an understanding if if you're in that group what um, what is entail, ent entailed in those reg regulatory requirements. Um, so there can sometimes be a lack of robust policies and programs as it relates to ergonomics. And sometimes the the ergonomic solutions can be seen as a, well, that's nice to have, that's not a need to have. So they have a hand tool that works, they don't need a power tool. Um, they stand all day, that's okay. They don't need opportunities to sit, um, things like that, because they're, they're in fact, not, not mandatory, but they're also, in my opinion, of course, they're not on the nice to have. That's a really important to have. So in conclusion, I think if you have the ability in your position, in your organization, it's important to foster ergonomics as a priority. Comfort surveys, I really like these. Not everyone does. There are some there are some pitfalls, but comfort surveys done right, especially at the very beginning of an ergonomic improvement process can, can provide a lot of enlightenment and can in fact be like this, this neon sign prioritizing, look at this first, look at this next. This is, here's, here's where our, here's where the troublemakers are. And then we can then come in and focus our ergonomic evaluations on those things that um, our employees really red flagged for us. So I'm very particular. Um, I know what I like, I know what works. Other things may work for other people, but first of all, I like my comfort surveys organized by body part frequency and task associated for each body part. So it might be the neck, it might be the shoulders, upper back, mid back, lower back, uh, upper arms, um, 
distal upper extremity, wrists, hands. And for each of those, I want to know from each employee, do you have discomfort? Um, it, how frequently? We, we use the Department of Labor terminology of rarely, occasionally, frequently, constantly. And for that body part and that frequency, what task or tool or whatever do you associate with that? And so it really creates um, it, it really creates a very clear map of where attention is needed. It's important to explain the purpose and what you intend to do with the information. So communication in the comfort survey process is um, is really key, and also managing expectations because there can be a an issue that's really it's a really important issue, and it requires. Um, capital budget, um, engineering support, and that might not be feasible for 18 months. And so employees might think, well, I did the survey. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything, you know, that ever came of that. And so they can become, um, a little jaded. So you can help manage those expectations and also have already planned something that you're going to implement that that you know would be meaningful for your employees and russell i'm not just saying this because this is an acromat webinar my i have a few go-to's my main go-to tends to be anti-fatigue mat and here's why when i get the surveys in i summarize these surveys and 80 percent of the time and I'm talking about manufacturing environments and all of you, you, you may, some of you may be in different environments, but in manufacturing environments, the frequency with which the, the most number of, of comfort surveyees say they, they have discomfort is related to standing. So anti-fatigue mats are, um, you can get them in quickly they uh, especially i mean and sometimes this some you know a department has really good anti-fatigue mats in place and then i choose a different solution but if they're worn or absent that's my go-to you get them in quickly they provide a high degree of comfort and and then you you know you use that kind of like an internal marketing like hey we heard you and we discovered that you have some standing discomfort and there are better things to come down the road but for but this is a thank you for participating in in the survey so so employees know that they were listened to and that you care there are a lot of um different uh, methods for for doing surveys. You can do employee surveys on the phone, on the computer. Um, I find that there's some misunderstanding there, and and while I modestly embrace technology, I kick it old school on comfort surveys. So I think in person is best. Paper pen is best. And being in an office setting is best. There are too many distractions out there on the floor. What you don't want to do is hand out the survey to your employee population and say, have it on my desk by Friday. Because if I'm doing work remotely and a supervisor does that and sends me the survey results, there is a high degree of probability that I'm going to bounce that right back because I manually summarize these surveys and deliver a report. And this is a garbage in, garbage out. So I like to get people in a conference room or a break room have them do the survey. I look at every survey before that employee walks out. And if it's incomplete or I think someone misunderstood something, we do some clarifications. And there are employees who have English as a second language um, barriers to submitting a good survey and people who, who may not be really proficient in reading and writing skills. And then we can sit down and do more of a inner um um, interview data collection systems. So, and then finally, really consider after you've implemented some ergonomic solutions, circle back, redo the surveys, and then you can quantify 
um, the, the, the degree of comfort improvement in your employee population. And then that's, again, a great advertisement that you can blast out to employees by saying, hey, we implemented these things, comfort levels went from this to this, and roll that up to your leadership for, um, again, some, some good results. So this is, this is really important, avoiding short-sighted measures. Um, especially in terms of purchasing equipment and making sure it meets the postural needs and comfort needs of your your employee, the range of your employee population, especially in high use workstations, and then teaching them how to use them. So, so these are these are four of my staples that I have pictured here, and I'm going to go through each of them um, in a little bit. But my my overarching theme is like, I know a lot about workbenches and anti-fatigue mats and chairs and casters, but I'm no expert in any one of these things. So relationship develop with these really important aspects of a lot of work environments, relationship develop with your vendors. And um, for these things, I kind of stay away from like, picking up something from, you know, from, from the big box industrial stores. So I'm going to start out with the image in the upper left, which is a fixed height workbench. And you can see that this employee is working low for his stature. He has a rounded upper back, a really flexed neck, and his arms are wing, winged out, which you wouldn't want to see. So, uh, <clears throat> But if I was working at this as a 10th percentile female, that workbench height could potentially be too high. So I highly recommend the investment in adjustable height workbenches. I mean, you might have them on your production floor for 25 years, buy right the first time. And I am not a fan of the crank model of height adjustable workstations because overwhelmingly employees don't use them and those cranks are removable and they get lost all the time. So, so level up and I recommend that you get a height adjustable workstation. My, my, my go-to here for clean room environments where they're stainless steel is a company called Terra Universal. They, they have a very high quality product. Um, as you might suspect when it comes to anti-fatigue mats, I favor Acromat. And again, not, not saying, I'm just telling you that employees overwhelmingly subjectively say they're the most comfortable mats and, you know, they're, they're not going to curl or, um, you know, create trip hazards or anything like that. That's just, it's just a quality product, whether you get a straight mat or whether here you, you can customize to fit a particular workstation. That's, that's my go-to. And I've been at companies where I can say, hey, Russell, I need your advice on this. And I and I have that, that's, that's having that resource. Industrial chairs, such as tall task stools. I'm not showing this picture because I think it's good. I'm showing it because it's pervasive in industry and it's not good. And I won't name the company, um, but they are they are almost everywhere I go. The, um, the seat pan and back are very uncomfortable. Um, there's very little adjustability. And within a couple months, it gets a terrible wobble. And then you're sitting around, you, you know, you're trying to work and your, your chair is wobbling underneath you. And that would be for the standing equivalent, like standing at a workbench in high heels where you didn't have a great base of support because you didn't have really good tennis shoes or safety shoes. So this is this is the high heels of standing and that, um, that foot bar breaks. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't take long and the hydraulics go out of it. So invest in, um, in, invest in quality seating, even though you could buy three of these for one of the quality seating. Again, it's going to be in your work area for decades. Um, the, the, the vendor that I use, and I don't know how, um, how universal they are, like across the United States, 
um, but it's ergogenesis and they carry a variety of chairs. Um, one of my favorites is body built, which you can buy a lot of places. So, so in, invest in good quality products and also invest in your vendors. Pull ergonomics into remodels and expansions. I, I have a couple phenomenal examples of this that I won't go into, but no, if you're if you're a single site, be meet with your facilities manager, learn about upcoming projects, and if at all, get ergonomics involved. I worked for a global manufacturer and quarterly I met with the global facilities director and he would give me a roadmap of of when to make contact, who to contact, what some of the issues were, um, and 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 it, that system just worked phenomenally. Pay importance to lab areas if you have lab areas, because they are typically designed for processes and not people. Um, space constrained areas as well, and everyone's space constrained. I don't walk into anywhere and go, wow, you have an abundance of additional space because you would have turned that into profit earning space. So we tend to go vertical and we need solutions for that, whether it's manual vertical shelving and storage or automated or space planning, um, um, labeling signage. So there are, um, and, 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 and some of this is true for office ergonomics as well. Early reporting systems. Okay, this is vital, especially if we go back to that um, MSD pyramid, right? Um, make sure that employees trust you and they feel valued and, and try to determine if there could be any perceived threats that would prevent them from doing that, such as a contract employee who is having discomfort, who really wants to become a permanent full-time employee. And they think that if they report, they they're, they're not going to get selected for that. I've, I've had that happen a couple of times. Know your employee population um, relationship develop. And this is, this is certainly more challenging to do in invisible employee populations, such as clean rooms, where it, it, you just don't go in there as much. You have to put on a bunny suit and you go in there and you're trying to talk to someone, but you can't tell who they are because all you can see are their eyes and their safety glasses. Um, off-site employees, uh, like, you know, at home office, um, people or, or your off shift people, how often do they have contact? How often are you having conversations with them and getting to know them? Because they're much more likely to report if, if you have some kind of rapport for them and make your, if someone does get an injury, make your work injury management system as pleasant and streamlined as possible because it's just it's it's bad enough to have an injury and then you're dealing with physicians and therapy and HR and EHS and operations and and workers comp and some people just may not have the skill set to deal well with those complex systems so so make it as easy as possible they might not sing your praises to their coworkers if you make it as good as can be but if it's a horrible experience, other employees in their area will definitely know about it, and that might hinder their desire to um, to report and have to go through what their um, their coworker went through. Okay, this this is very important to me. This is near and dear in my heart, and that's to replace initiatives with sustained values. The word initiative insinuates that you're instigating or you're, you're in initiating something, but these tend to come and go. And, and you know the program that gets started and then it gets dropped. Um, and, and that can make employees feel a little bit jaded. Um, this is in, in terms of ergonomics, this is so often seen in stretching programs in particular and in job rotation programs. So you want to make sure to anticipate roadblocks and build sustainment into the process, like what time of day. Um, I prefer beginning of the workday for material handlers and a third of the way um, in the workday for people who do very fine and manipulative things and really need a break from all of that. How are you going to train new employees? Are you going to do it group or solo? Solo almost never works. So if you want that to succeed, you have to plan for that. Um, 
I customize. The warehouse workers have different stretching needs than clean room workers or people who do very fine types of things. You can use super stretchers, either find a, a lead or an employee that's passionate and, and basically put them in charge of leading the stretches, making sure that people are doing them correctly, trying to um, teaching and they, they need extra training, right? You need to really train them how to deal with um, low participators. You know, when you're supposed to be doing a really robust stretch and, and someone is just not into it and they're doing it by half measures, which can affect the rest of um, the rest of the group. Um, and there, there is often a drop off of leader, manager, supervisor um, investment in this. So you want to build something in like scheduling, maybe for the leader, it's participating quarterly, manager, it's participating monthly, supervisor participating once, once a week. And then consider... Um, doing stretches, um, like like redoing your stretches or building some life into your stretching program, such as a competition between departments, some kind of reward system um, that will keep it sustaining. So sustainment is really the rebar to your ergonomics concrete. It's, um, you can start and stop something, but sustaining it is, is really meaningful. And that really does show what the company's core values are. Okay, this is this is the last big slide, and I'm going to have to fast track this story, but it's a great story. So chapter one, Houston, we have a problem. We acquired a company that had a process that was vital, bread and butter product. Um, they had 17 or 19 recordable injuries in this not very big department in five years. Three of them were huge, both in cost and settlement and the amount of employee disability. And the primary process, I won't go into it because they, they did some proof of concept prototypes to, to try to make it less manual. But at the end of the day, the hands were the best tool for the job. And we couldn't change that. And so what we, we, we took a two prong approach. The first piece of that was um, uh, chapter four, the little things add up. We couldn't change the central process. So we changed eight or 10 little things around that. Um, reaches, um, getting rid of some finger pressure, a, a bunch of things, adjustable height workstations. Um, and then it was it was really evident that people had to rotate out of this frequently. So the leader, which is chapter five, the leader with the iron will, we developed a rotation schedule that was extremely aggressive. And if for some reason people couldn't rotate due to people being out for the flu, we had too many new employees who weren't cross trained, whatever. Um, Action number one was that the engineers in that area dropped what they were doing, um, even if it was you know pretty important, if it was vital, maybe not, and got in there and got into the rotation to see if we could keep that rotation going. And option number two was that that process was halted until we could do rotation. If, if the engineers couldn't fulfill that need, so we kept some some safety stock on hand because again, bread and butter, money maker product, have to get it out the door. And I and and this has been going on for years. I've never seen commitment um, at this level. So if you if you have a problem, you don't think that you can address. You can. It's just it's going to take a lot of can do attitude and investment and support from your leader. In closing. Um, We've reviewed a lot of aspects of proactive ergonomics. You don't have to boil the ocean, um, especially if you're kind of kind of new to this investment. Pick one or two, either easy to implement or um, or where it's going to make the most impact, or or maybe um, one of each. One that's easy, one one that's challenging, right? Um, and commit and implement and sustain. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mary. I'm going to stop the screen share and we'll jump into the Q&A. So that's been very helpful, very enlightening. Lots of things I didn't know in there. So <clears throat> appreciate that. Thank you. Um, very interesting to see the, the pyramid and 
Um, the amount of that what stood out to me was just the amount of opportunity down there at the bottom of the pyramid to For prevent sure. that escalating. So very helpful. All right, um, we'll jump into the Q and A. We've got a few questions on here. So the first question is a question from Kyle. He says, "What is your recommended lifetime for anti fatigue matting? Should they re be replaced yearly, every six months, etc.?" what do you look at to determine if they're worn out? Do you have any thoughts right away on that? Well, I, I think there are some variables, right? Like how, how much it's used, if it's, and, and Russell, you, <laughs> this, this question should be for you, but from my perspective, what I, it depends on um, high use, whether it's driven over by carts, whether it's exposed to certain environmental um, factors and, and the materials, there are some anti-fatigue mats that are extremely rigid, and I haven't found that they provide much relief, and and employees haven't, and and they say, yeah, this is a this is a fifteen year map, okay, but it's not it's not really helping my employees, right? So, I I think it would be valuable to go to if you have a, a you know a a manufacturer in mind to to go to them and ask for the specifics about your work area and the map that that you're using. Excellent. Yeah, I would echo that as well. And what we often encourage is just regular assessments so that you're keeping on top of it. Because like you say, it's not going to be the same from one area to the next or, um, you know, even two workstations in the same environment may be different based on the the shift schedule and things like that. So definitely keep an eye on it and go back to the expected life expectancy that the manufacturer would recommend for that product as well. So that's great. Um, Adam asks a question. He says, I may be wrong, but I believe two states, California and Washington, have state ergonomic standards. Have you heard any feedback from this or have you seen them? Just curious. Well, first of all, I think um, Washington State was the first, so they probably have the most mature program. They have a lot of resources that ergonomists will go to their website and and tap into that. So I think that's probably your most robust program. Um, I, I don't know much about Oregon's. I think really the most that I, I know about is um, is Washington and then followed by Minnesota just because I'm really following this closely and want to understand the very specifics of those programs. So for example, in Minnesota, you have to have an ergonomics team that um, reports up to a safety team. You have to have a written program. You, you have to do a certain amount of evaluations and um, and again, I'm going to learn more about this. I uh, one of my colleagues is um, the ergonomist that's going to be um, handling the regs for Minnesota, and I and I called her when this first came out, and she and I said, "Can you give me the information?" And she said, "I don't even know anything about it. They put this into law, and they we haven't gotten any guidance, so it's going to be a couple months. So I'm really interested to attend that webinar tomorrow to learn more about the specifics of how employers need to best prepare to um, meet these regulations head on and be successful with them. Very good. Yeah, that's helpful. We did have a question right around that, what to do to prepare. So appreciate that one as well. Um, Dan has a question. What are the top, say, two to three things that you would look for when considering anti-fatigue mats? I know you touched on it briefly. Do you have any sort of top three takeaways that you'd want to consider? Yeah, um, it, number one is, um, is, is comfort, right? And, 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 but it's, it's a balance between comfort and stability because mats that are too squishy, um, they, they, they make your, your ankles kind of like wobble, like, you know, and, and that in and of itself can be fatiguing and work its way up your lower extremities and into your back, because if your feet are doing this, your low back is doing this. So I, I like a combination of 
stability and comfort and consider the area you know they're they're mats that are you, you know make sure it's correct for your environment if you have wet surfaces if you have chemical exposure to your mats um you know i don't like to go into a work area and see mats doubled up on each other or i like mats that lie really flat and don't have the potential for a toe to accidentally catch and, and and kick up because now you've introduced a potential tripping hazard. That's very good. I appreciate that. I was just recalling when you were talking, we had that experience and we at your previous company where that employee was um, walking backwards and caught their heel on the edge where two mats were together and it was a, a near miss. So they, these are real life um, stories or examples that actually happen. And um, back to your pyramid, there's ways to prevent that isn't there if you if you get in there early you can avoid anyone reaching the top of that pyramid so 